What's up everyone? It's Father Charles here. Welcome back to Catholic Themes in Tolkien, or welcome the first time if you've never been here before. I'm a Catholic priest. I love God. I also love Tolkien and Lord of the Rings, and I love discussing the ways that Tolkien's Catholic faith influenced his writing of the story, was absorbed into the story, so to speak, and into the symbolism uh, for our reading pleasure. Today I want to talk about more on this theme of friendship we talked about in a previous video, fellowship, koinonia. Uh, it's a very Christian theme. It's this idea of uh, sharing in the oneness of God through our oneness with one another. Sacrificial love plays very prominently in that. Today I want to zero in on one friendship in particular, the friendship of Frodo and Sam, particularly Samwise Gamgee, because I think Samwise Gamgee, in addition to being just such an incredibly and endear incredibly endearing character, uh, I think really is the model friend. Uh, he shows for us uh, kind of what Tolkien meant by friendship, what friendship meant to Tolkien. Tolkien calls Sam a more representative hobbit than any others that we have to see much of. In the Stairs of Kirith Ungol chapter, Sam and Frodo have a revelation of being part of this ongoing story of Middle-earth that stretches back to Baron and Luthien. If you've never read the Silmarillion, you might be scratching your head. It's one of the beautiful things about Tolkien is that he had such a store of lore of Middle-earth that when you read the story, you kind of get this sense that you're just getting the tip of the iceberg. It's one of the things that makes his world seem so real so thick and full and solid, if you will. And it makes it feel sometimes as if you're reading actual history. Uh, obviously, we really don't believe that it happened, but it happened somewhere in our hearts. And the characters themselves are conscious of the fact that they are a part of an ongoing story. The same story of which you and I are a part. So it's one of the low points for Frodo and Sam. They're on their way to Shalub's lair. Of course, they don't know this, but the treacherous golem is leading them into a trap. They kind of sense that he's up to no good. Uh, they know that probably some dark horrors await them. They also know that there's no other way into Mordor, and if they're to fulfill their quest, then it's this or nothing. So they're subsisting on the Lemboss bread, Gollum has been their guide. Gollum has disappeared, and we don't know what happened to Gollum. Well, later on we find out that Gollum is consulting with Shalob to set up his trap for Frodo and Sam. But at any rate, they're feeling pretty miserable. They're, they're depressed. They're very frightened. And Sam and Frodo have a revelation of being a part of this ongoing story of Middle-earth. Uh, significantly, it's Sam who first sees it. His maturation throughout the story kind of releases his inner poet. He becomes more and more glib as the story progresses. He becomes a little less rustic, if you will, and a little more elvish. And so he wonders at this point what it would be like if their own tale were to be read one day by some father to his son out of a great big book with red and black letters years and years afterwards. Sam highlights the great role of Frodo, who then shifts the emphasis, and he says, I want to hear more about Sam, Dad. Frodo wouldn't have gotten far without Sam, would he, Dad? Sam downplays the tongue Frodo. He shouldn't make fun. I was serious. So was I, replies Frodo. I want to stop right there for a minute. This is a little bit of a tangent, but it's a beautiful one. I think it's worth taking. Um, it's so beautiful that the way that they describe their story is, in future ages, a father reading to a son. This is how the whole Middle-earth saga got started. Tolkien was already beginning to sketch out his legendarium in his uh, days of recuperation after trench fever, after the Battle of the Somme in World War I. Uh, but it was really in telling bedtime stories to his children that the story of The Hobbit really came to take shape. We talked about it in a previous video about how Tolkien one day uh, saw a blank exam paper. He was creating those blue books for extra money. And he was so delighted by the empty paper that he wrote, In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. And it was a revelation to him. He thought to himself, hmm, what's a hobbit? And so he began sharing these stories with his kids. He had four kids. 
And when they were little, he'd tell them a story about, you know, Bilbo Baggins and a dragon and the, the dwarves and a wizard named Gandalf. And uh, little by little, this is how The Hobbit came to take shape. In fact, if you're looking for more on this, check out Letters to Father Christmas. It's a book by Tolkien. It's actually a compilation of letters. So when his kids were little, they believed in Santa Claus, Father Christmas, and they'd write him letters. And Tolkien would write letters back to his kids uh, as if it were Father Christmas. And it con they uh, contain little sketches of little elves and all kinds of adventures, and there's polar bear. And you really see what a, what a fatherly heart Tolkien had and what delight he took in sharing stories with his children. There are some scholars who maintain that The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings both started out as stories that Tolkien wrote to his kids. And as the kids grew up and their, their struggles came more significant, so did the stories. Uh, in fact, this very chapter we're discussing, the Stairs of Kirith Ungol, the choices of Master Samwise, the last part of the two towers. Tolkien was actually writing segments of this, sending them off to his son, Christopher, who was in World War II. They didn't know what was going to happen. For all they know, Hitler was going to take over the world, uh, and everybody would be wearing swastikas. Uh, so there was, they were really up against Saruman and orcs, and uh, Tolkien was filled with uncertainty, as was his son. And there's these beautiful uh, letters that Tolkien wrote to Christopher, uh, talking about Christopher's reaction to these stories, talking about C.S. Lewis's reaction to these chapters as he wrote them. So at any rate, Sam and Frodo are, are seeing a bigger picture. You know, in spite of the horror that they're going through, Sam tells Frodo, hey, maybe one day this thing that we're going through, maybe it'll be part of a great tale. So anyway, getting back to the stairs of Kareth Ungol, Sam is talking about Baron and Luthien, uh, the story. It's a long story. It's a beautiful story. It's told in the Silmarillion. I think it would make a great movie, by the way. And Sam says that, hey, remember when Baron went to get that Silmaril in order to win the hand of Luthien, his wife, his would-be wife, and the terrors that he went through? And, uh, and then, wait a minute. You've got a little bit of that light in the file of Galadriel, the star glass that the lady gave you. We're going to talk a lot more about this in the tradition chapter. It was the last remaining light from the two trees that went to the Silmarils and then they were lost and a little bit of that light was in the star glass, the file of Galadriel she gave to Frodo. So Sam recognizes, whoa, we are part of a great story. The same light that Baron had from the Silmarils is the same light that you've got. You're in the tradition of these great heroes. It's Sam who points this out. Verlin Flieger is a Tolkien scholar, a wonderful Tolkien scholar. I've learned so much from her. She has this beautiful chapter. Where she's talking about Tolkien as a postmodern medievalist and about how he ingeniously addressed postmodern issues uh, in spite of the ancient medieval clothing that his tales wore. And she's addressing critics who sort of snub Tolkien or turn, turn up their noses at Tolkien. This sort of common genre that was beneath the literati of, of the 20th century. And she says, you know, this is pretty meta. This is pretty knowing. This is pretty aware of Tolkien. He gives us a little wink to his reader. He realizes, yes, of course, this is a story. And I know exactly what I'm doing. Um, and I'm even going to give my characters an awareness that they are a part of a story. But then it's to point to the reader that they themselves are part of a story. So again, Sam is the one who is calling our attention to this. Beautiful scene. I love it. A few pages later, even the treacherous and wasted Gollum is moved by the tender sight of Frodo asleep in Sam's lap. It says peace was in both of their faces. Gollum puts out a trembling hand to touch Frodo's knee, but almost the touch was a caress, Tolkien tells us. The moment of near repentance is lost for Gollum when Sam stirs and he reacts with harshness and accusation towards him. It's one of Sam's faults. Uh, he was a really, really great guy, um, but boy, he was very protective of Master Frodo. And he was pretty harsh with Gollum. Gollum probably had it coming. Uh, but Tolkien called this one of the most tragic points of the tale uh, because he says Gollum was moved, you know, the, the, the Hobbit 
so to speak, that was in Gollum, deep down in Smeagol, that little uncorrupted part of him, he saw the tenderness that existed between Frodo and Sam. He saw a glimpse of true friendship. And he realized how alienated he was. He realized how lost he was. Maybe it didn't come to him in perhaps that, that clear of a way, but it says he reached out and his touch was almost like a caress. And then Sam sort of rebukes him and the moment is lost. Tolkien thought that was a very tragic moment in the tale, but one that follows the logic of, of who the characters were and sort of what they were about. Uh, Tolkien wrote often and movingly of Sam in his letters. He says, my Sam Gamgee is indeed a reflection of the English soldier or the privates and Batman I knew in the 1914 war and recognized as so far superior to myself. Tolkien, who served among the educated officers, was referring to the Batman of lower class and means who assisted the officers, like Tolkien, often performing the more menial tasks on their behalf. They were often and the front line of the battles in front of the officers, and they were often the first to die. Tolkien emphasized that Sam's full name was not Samuel, but Samwise, which means halfwit. In 1944, when Tolkien had not even finished writing The Two Towers, again, Christopher was in World War II, he called Sam the jewel among the hobbits. And later he said he's the most closely drawn character, the successor of Bilbo of the first book, the genuine hobbit. And he goes on to say, Frodo's not so interesting because he has to be high-minded and has, as it were, a vocation. The book will probably end with Sam. Frodo will naturally become too ennobled and rarefied by the achievements of the great quest and will pass west with all the great figures. But Sam will settle down to the Shire in gardens and inns. And in a lengthy, now famous letter of Tolkien to his publisher, Milton Waldman, Tolkien called Sam the chief hero of the Lord of the Rings. Now, this is significant, and it's not immediately obvious to a first-time reader. It certainly wasn't to me. How could the humble Sam, whom Tolkien once said is meant to be lovable and laughable, be more heroic than the great and noble Aragorn or the wise and lofty Gandalf? Repeated and careful readings are required to begin seeing what Tolkien meant. True to his prediction in 1944, eight years before its publication, The Lord of the Rings indeed ends with Sam returning to the domestic warmth of his wife, his daughter, and his well-tended garden and hobbit hole in Bag End after seeing Frodo off in the West. Well, I am back, he says in the book's iconic last words. Stratford Caldecott argues the case that Sam is indeed the central hero insisting that it is Sam, more than Frodo, who is the incarnation of the Shire and most deeply rooted in its soil. Sam's growing to maturity and the healing of the Shire go hand in hand, says Calcott. This makes perfect sense, for Tolkien once wrote that the plot is concerned with the ennoblement or the sanctification of the humble, something he found particularly moving. The Lord of the Rings is a story in which the first will be last and the last will be first, to quote the Gospel. The hobbits are humble, and Sam is the humblest, a servant without pretensions or ambitions, except maybe to have a garden of his own. For him to leave the Shire out of love for Frodo involves great sacrifice. He only knows he has to do his part, however hopeless his task may seem. Now, all this background on Sam is important uh, because it helps us appreciate his role as the friend par excellence. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says to his disciples, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you keep my commandments. Jesus said that at the Last Supper, uh, shortly before he proved the truth of his words, laying down his life for his friends, the disciples, and for us, his future friends. Even his enemies, who he hoped to one day convert into his friends. Sam repeatedly shows his willingness to lay down his own life for Frodo, both literally and figuratively. These are some of the best moments in the book. Just consider his willingness to leave the beloved Shire. His chasing Frodo into the Anduin River to accompany him after Frodo tries to make off on his own after the whole Boromir trying to steal the ring incident. He nearly drowns in the process. His fierce protectiveness of Frodo from Gollum and his willingness to endure the wretched creature 
at Frodo's insistence, his heroic standoff with Shelob to avenge his friend. His anguish over what to do after Frodo is seemingly dead, even to the point of considering abandoning the quest to give Frodo a proper burial. His giving of his own portions of water and Lemboss to Frodo during the last and darkest days of the quest, when they are on the road immediately leading to Mount Doom, and they're, they're being stuck with the orcs, and they're in filthy orc gear, and they're on a long march that is practically draining every last drop of their energy. And then his last desperate act of lifting Frodo to Ordruin, the cracks of doom to destroy the ring. I'll carry Mr. Frodo up myself if it breaks my back and heart, he says definitively during a self-argument against his own despair. Time and again, Sam exhibits heroic loyalty and friendship to a gospel-like degree. What a moving scene that was in the, in the movie, huh? Do you remember the Shire, Mr. Furl? It'll be spring soon. The orchards will be in blossom. And the birds will be nesting in the hazel thicket. And they'll be sowing the summer barley in the lower fields. And eating the first of the strawberries with cream. Do you remember the taste of strawberries? No, oh, Sam. I can't recall the taste of food. No, the, the sound of water. No, the touch of grass. Naked in the dark. There's, there's nothing. No veil between me and the wheel of fire. I can see him with my waking eyes. Then let us be rid of it. Once and for all. Come on, Mr. Frodo. I can't carry it for you. But I can carry you! Come on! didn't come across in the film, it's a beautiful detail that's in the book, is it says that when Sam lifted up Frodo, to put him on his back, to carry him up the last leg of the journey, it says, to Sam's astonishment, he seemed light. He seemed light. I can't remember exactly how he put it. I'll put the graphic on the screen. I want to share with you a story, incidentally, that kind of relates to that. I once knew a man, early on in my priesthood, as my first assignment, he was a veteran of the Battle of Normandy Beach. And uh, one of the survivors, of course, and he had horrible trauma and memories of the event. Uh, he hadn't talked about it for years and years and years. Well, this man had, had an aneurysm, a brain aneurysm, somehow managed to survive. He was a tough guy, and he had a long recuperation. So I would meet him once a week, and I would give him communion. And as he recovered, we became very good friends. We began chatting. And one day, uh, when he was getting better, he gave me this manila envelope and it contained the manuscript of his, of his war stories. He says, I've, I've only shown this to a handful of people. In fact, it was an old saintly priest who was a good friend of his who had told him when he had heard some of his stories, he said, you really need to write this down for posterity. He really hesitated to do it because he said he didn't want to make himself look like a hero. Um, he credited God's grace. He credited the heroism of the people around him as the reason that he was alive. He had a lot of survivor's guilt. Anyway, he said, even my own wife hasn't, hadn't read this until I wrote it, and he gave it to me as a gift to read. So, absolutely beautiful. And there's this, there's this part in there where he says, after all the death and carnage that he's witnessing around him, he said he was convinced he was never going to get out of it alive. And he said at a certain point, he prayed to God. He said, God, he says, I just pray that in this place of hell, this place of inhumanity, this place where, where people are just re resorting to their most basest and violent instincts, I pray that I won't lose my soul. I pray that if I die, I can die honorably. In fact, he says, I pray, Lord, that you'd give me an opportunity to exercise tremendous heroism. 
And he said he felt like the Lord said, thank you, I've heard your prayer, I'll let you know when the time is right. He said, well, sure enough, there was this moment, of course, this is in the middle of winter. He says all the guys were given just a, a government issue sweater and some threadbare gloves. And he says the guys were getting hypothermia, frostbite, it was terrible. Cold was one of their greatest enemies. One of the guys got shot. He was bleeding out and he was shivering like crazy. And they had to get him away to safety, to a medic, but it was about 10 minutes away. They had to get him off the front lines where the fighting was strongest and get him away. And the guy was freezing cold, he was shivering, and he was bleeding out. And the, the guy said, the guy said, look, he's not going to make it. He's just, he's too cold. And he said, this is my moment. And he said he took off his sweater, put it on the guy gave him a kiss on his forehead and said, you're going to be all right. Guy went off. The guy made it. The guy was saved. And this is, this is the most amazing part. The guy said, from that moment on, I never felt cold. I never felt cold. He said, in fact, he said, I felt warm. He said, I suffered a lot of other things. I was hungry. I was scared. There still was violence and chaos all around me. But he says it actually rallied the troops when they saw his act of heroism. Uh, it kind of became infectious. And the guys gain strength and courage from this beautiful act. I always think of that whenever I think of the story of Samwise Gamgee putting Frodo desperately on his back and then suddenly realizing to his astonishing surprise, he felt light. So in the Tower of Kirith Ungol, when Sam experiences a brief but powerful temptation to put on the ring, this is after Frodo's body, which Sam now learns is not dead, but was only numbed, and sort of put to sleep, if you will, by the poison of Shalob's bite. Now Sam's trying to get Frodo back, and he's got the ring. And so it says, for a, mo for a few moments, even Samwise, humble Samwise, experiences these kind of psycho ring temptations. We're told it was the love of his master that helped most to hold him firm, along with his unconquered plain hobbit sense. That's what Tolkien tells us about Sam. Sam's love of his master is perhaps an essential and inseparable part of his hobbit sense. Part of the hobbit sense is that despite their absurdity and their parochialism, they have a unique ability to love simply and with devotion what is given. Be it land, food, friends, or anything else which they can cherish more than self. I think that's what it means to be a friend. It means to be second. It means to love somebody enough to put their needs, their happiness, their well-being, above your own, and to do it on a consistent basis. Wow, if we have one or two of those people in our life, how blessed we are. If we can learn, eventually, to get over ourselves and our ego and our pride and be that for one or two other people in this world, wow, how blessed we are. Tolkien once wrote that hobbits, as a branch of humans, not elves or dwarves, are entirely without non-human powers, but are more in touch with nature, the soil and other living things, plants and animals, and free from ambition or the greed of wealth. They're made small by Tolkien in this world, a little, about half of human stature, partly to exhibit the pettiness of man, uh, but also to show that in creatures of very small physical power, the amazing unexpected heroism of ordinary men at a pinch, as Tolkien says. Tolkien can be hard on hobbits. In various letters, he accused them of mental myopia, cocksureness, smugness, a readiness to measure and sum up all things from a limited experience. He even said at one point, imagine Sam without his education by Bilbo and his fascination with things elvish. However, Sam did have a fascination of all things elvish. In fact, it's one of the things that got him out the door to join Frodo, his excitement to see the elves. And given the chance to leave the Shire and grow, especially given the chance to leave the Shire and accompany his beloved friend and master, Mr. Frodo, he said yes. He accepted the challenge. He rose to the occasion. Tolkien admits that Sam was cocksure and a little bit conceited, but his conceit had been transformed by his devotion to Frodo. He did not think of himself as heroic or even brave, or in any way admirable except in his service and loyalty to his master. Even the limitations of Sam, whom Tolkien called the more representative hobbit than any others, are ennobled through his love and devotion to Frodo. 
Sam's heroism does not involve special intelligence. It doesn't involve strength, wisdom, skill in battle, or elvish craft. It is a peculiar, shyer grown form of heroism, drawn out precisely within the context of loyal friendship and love for his beloved Mr. Frodo. Tom Shippey once wrote that hobbits are the bridge connecting the ancient heroic world with the modern one. They are anachronistic in the sense that they are essentially modern in their attitudes and sentiment while being imported into the historical world of Middle Earth in order to guide the reader's reactions to help the reader feel what it would be like to be there. Seems an apt judgment. In fact, if you've ever read The Silmarillion, you know that at many moments, even for hardcore Tolkien lore lovers, it can be kind of a hard read. And I think part of that is because it's all of the elevated elvish stuff, uh, but you don't have the absurdity of the hobbits in there. It's sort of the comic relief. It's sort of the bridge as the hook, you know, to draw ordinary people of today's world in the way the hobbits do so brilliantly in, in The Lord of the Rings and in The Hobbit. For although we are imported figuratively into the tale of The Lord of the Rings, we nevertheless can see the applicability of the story to our own modern lives and uh, whatever quest that we might be on. While perhaps lacking the wisdom of Gandalf or the nobility of Aragorn or the ethereal grace of the elves, as hobbits, we can still play a significant role in the quest. And I think that's one of the reasons why Lord of the Rings is so endearing. It's those hobbits, right? They win our hearts. Uh, we start to realize that, how does Galadriel put it in the movie? Even the smallest person uh, can change the course of history. What a beautiful consolation that is for us. Most of you watching this are, are small people. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not great history makers, we're not great headline makers. We're trying our best in our own little hobbit hole, in our own little patch of the Shire, our own little bag end, to love our own Mr. Frodo that's been given to us, to grow our own, our own sunflowers and nasturtiums, you know, to cultivate our own garden, uh, to make our little corner of the world better, and to, to rise to the occasion, uh, to even be heroic when need be. Not because we're big shots, not because we're naturally heroic, uh, but because maybe, just maybe, we've been able to learn how to love another person more than ourselves. Uh, we've learned what it means to be second. And in doing so, we go on our own quest. We can even become the chief hero of the story, like Samwise Gamgee. There's a lot more we could say about Sam. One other thing I just want to add, I was really disappointed in the movie the way that Frodo and Sam and the Return of the King sort of had this rift. The way Frodo kind of really goes off on Sam in a really mean way and sends him packing. That never happened in the book. In fact, they enter into Shelob's lair hand in hand. Uh, part of the beauty of the whole saga of Frodo and Sam is that they did stick together. And the fact that Sam was fiercely loyal to Frodo throughout. So, yeah, there was tension between Frodo and Sam in the book. But it never, ever devolved into this sort of Frodo sending Sam packing. It was so heartbreaking. It was needless. I don't know. I don't understand why Peter Jackson did that. Maybe you've got some other views on it. Uh, maybe you enjoyed it. But I just thought it really took away from some of the strength and the solidity. One of the strongest, most solid forces in the whole story was Samwise Gamgee's friendship and loyalty to Frodo. Now, I know that he came back at the key moment in order to save Frodo, but... I don't know. It just seemed like a needless rift that Peter Jackson introduced and kind of a needless heartbreak, to be honest with you. But that's just me. I hope you've enjoyed this take on friendship. Again, there's a lot more we could say about Samwise Gamgee. Here we've simply talked about him in the context of the perfect friend, the model friend, the chief hero, the genuine hobbit. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.